Time for us to get started. Let's open with a word of prayer, please. Father, I thank you for this day. Oh, God, what a wonderful day it is to come and to worship you. Father, I thank you for all our special guests this morning. God, I just pray that they can feel the love of Jesus as they enter this place. Father, I just pray that everything we do here this morning is done to bring glory and honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Go over a few announcements real quick. Uh, most of them will be on the wall up here. So I'll just briefly go through them. The youth starting Bible drill and heart to heart. They got a kickoff banquet tomorrow night. Talk to Miss Rossi. She can straighten you out on that. Young at Heart will be Tuesday morning on the 11th. Special guest speaker Ken Hatfield. Uh, Children's Choir started on Wednesday night. Miss Mears excited about that. Lots of kids, they come and they have a lot of fun. So bring your children to choir. And then we have our fall food roundup for the Baptist Children's Home. A uh, lot of other events coming up. You can see them there tomorrow evening. We will have uh, our outreach and visitation. If you'd like to come join us for that. We'll leave here at 6 o'clock. So be here about 5.30. There'll be somebody here in Coffee Made at 5. So. Any other announcements real quick? Yes, Matt. Oh, yes. this is loud. Matt d mentioned Heart to Heart. Tomorrow night is our kickoff. If you have not already completed a registration form and you want to participate, Shelly Wilkerson has them in her hand. If you will raise your hand up high, she will bring you one so that you can fill it out and get it back to us today. We have a special night planned tomorrow night, and you really don't want to miss it. Also, Heart and Moms, we will meet with you for about five or ten minutes right after the service this morning. Okay, we got a short video <coughs> now about a prayer class that's starting next week in the evening. What motivates me to pray is that I believe it works. We're surrounded by a tremendously needy world, and we lack the means to meet those needs, but we know a God who can. The only thing that Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to do was to pray. We believe in the power of prayer. We have a very real God, but we also have a very real enemy. Learn how to stand against him using the power of the word and prayer. We want to learn how to strategically and scripturally become prayer warriors who pray for ourselves and for other people. What would happen if you became a prayer warrior? What would happen if your church really began to seek the Lord in prayer? We're gonna learn about the types of prayer, the ways that God answers, hindrances to prayer that we need to deal with keys to effective prey, and we're going to experience God to a greater degree in our lives. Join us for the Battle Plan for Prayer Bible study. Amen. Let's stand together. Scorned by the 
ones he came to save, till on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Y'all have a seat. Shaken, left alone. We are fallen far from home. In these nightmares, 
city of dust. In the wilderness, with no one to trust. These chains, and all these scars. The darkness blocks out the stars. And I'm blinded. I can't find the way. I don't know if I'll see another day. Who can lift the veil, break the chains? Who will shine a light that can take the pain? You found me here. Led me to the sun. When we walk together, we are better than one. How many of you brought a friend today? Raise your hand. There's friends all over the place. We'd love to know that you are here. There on your bulletin, there's a flap, a portion that uh, if you'll give us some information about you, then uh, later on the guys are going to come by for the time of the church's offering. If you'll just l uh, lay that in there for us, we'd love to have a record of you being here today. It's great to have all of our friends with us. Roxy and I was going to sing about, and you reflect on the friends that you have brought today, and those, those friends that wasn't able to make it. How close, and how much did they mean to you? A 
stand together. The splendor of the King clothed in majesty tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our god age to age he stands
make your way down. You know what we get to do today? We get to praise Jesus Christ. Amen. What a great. Thank you for all the people being here, all the smiles on your face. We're going to receive a blessing. Just pray. Lord God, we come to you today, Lord. Just, I ask you to just bind Satan off his tongue today, Lord. And Lord, just fill Brother Mike with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Prepare our hearts for the message he has for us, Lord. And let it hit us right in the heart, Lord. And hope that people come and know you today. And Lord, just thank you for the music we had this morning. The Lord, it's very touching. And Lord, just... If we take up your tithes and offers, Lord, just bless the gift and the giver, Lord, and may you use and glorify your kingdom. In your sweet name we pray. Amen. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give, oh, the shape that we were in. Just when all hope seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, come. Table. 
Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these thieves. No one are welcome here. That sin and shame that you brought with you, you can leave them at the door and let mercy draw you near. So. To the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to, to the, the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all, all the paupers and the princes, princes all, all who fail, you've been forgiven, all, all who dream and all who suffer, all who loved and lost another, all the change and all the grief. All who follow, all who lead, anyone who's been let down, all the lost who have been found, all who can live around all, to everyone who hears his song. Come to the table, come join the sinners you have been. to the table. Man. Well, amen. Who'd have thought that beautiful voice come out of that big old guy? Amen. <laughs> I didn't say nothing about your head. <laughs> <laughs> I love him to death, I tell you what. He, uh, he makes me a better preacher. Got something to preach at every Sunday, amen. <laughs> amen. No, that's a great message. That's like your testimony. You know, uh, that's really what this is about, isn't it? It's, we come here this morning, uh, a bunch of misfits, broken people, not everybody is perfect. You know, sometimes people think that the church is a place for everybody's got it all figured out. And we just here because we need to, we're still trying to figure it out. Amen? We do know the answer is Jesus Christ. And we do know that the, there's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And we trust in that this morning. And the only difference in us in the world is we've called for the grace of God to forgive our sins. And God has redeemed us, He's forgiven us, and He's given us a fresh start. If you're here this morning and don't know Him that way, just know that when you come here, when you come to Washtenaw and any other church, if we'll be honest, you come to a place of broken people. You come to a place of people that hadn't got it all figured out, that uh, still trying to figure everything out. We just know the answer and the goal line that we're headed for is Jesus and uh, trying to please Him and serve Him. And so this morning we are... 
are grateful for what God is doing. Hey, we've got something special right now for, for the little ones. We have a children's church program, so if you're visiting this morning, and if you're four-year-old up through third grade and want to go out for a separate service, Miss Dawn and uh, Miss Susie and Miss Brooke, and right now half the ladies in the church are going to leave and go over there. But, uh, but no, they're going to go over there, and uh, we're sure glad that, that they get a chance to teach. We're glad for their willingness to volunteer and work over there in our, in our uh, children's church area. We also have a nursery back there. If you're visiting and didn't know that, we do have a nursery. If you want to put your children in there up to three years old, and uh, you can sure do that. And parents, if you want to walk over there and see where they are so you can be sure and get them afterwards, we have one rule here. Do not leave your children with us. We do not want to keep them. <laughs> and so you go get them when church is over. But uh, uh, it's in the building right next door. So those of you that are visiting this morning, in case you don't know, there are restrooms right out front here and water uh, uh, fountain out there. And uh, we're just honored that you're here today to come visit us, be a part of this service. I am uh, this morning teaching through, been several weeks now, if you're visiting, you didn't know this, but I'm just teaching through the book of James. So this is just a normal service for us. And we've come to James chapter 3 this morning, if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. While you're turning, how many of you like me a while ago, your heart skipped a beat? Has your heart ever skipped a beat? Huh? Well, mine skipped about three beats, right in a row. And it was when that music started playing, and Brother Whalen and Miss Roxy went out and got Matt. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. No, Matt's not going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I knew we couldn't handle that. I knew there was something else had to be in the making right there. I'll tell you what, that's the first time I'd ever thought about shooting somebody before the music got through the introduction. I, I wasn't going to take Waylon and Roxy out of it. I was going to take Matt out. I'd probably let out to be. She'd been all right. But, uh, but uh, so glad to have all of you here this morning. Remember Brother Ray Hendricks? Uh, he had a slight stroke yesterday. And uh, I was in the hospital and still having some side effects from that. So just keep him in your prayers this morning, if you would. James chapter 3, we're talking this morning about the subject of taming the tongue. What a very practical message this is. The book of James, James was an earthly half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning by that, that they had the same father and mother, uh, or the same mother, I should say. Uh, but Joseph, who was Mary. Uh, earthly husband was not the father of Jesus. We know God was the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he was God in the flesh. But, but they, were, they were raised in the same family, if you will, James. And he was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And uh, so there, there is leading this first century church. He, he wrote this book as really a, almost a, a Sunday school curriculum for the church. To things to teach. And some of the things that are taught here are some very practical things about the Christian life. You see, the Bible says when we get saved, when we have Christ come into our life, and we put Him on the throne of our life, really that's kind of like Him, kind of like Him getting on the heart. The heart is the seat of our emotions in our life. And, and, it, and the Bible says, Jesus said, out of the abundance of in your heart, what's full in your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth, He said. And so here James kind of takes that and goes a little further and talks about the power of words or the effect of words, which again Jesus would say, and those words are coming from the heart. And the heart is what we want to change. The heart is the part that, that God wants to be Lord over. And it's in that heart where God takes his throne. And so let's look at that this morning. Something we do here just to kind of honor the Word of God. If you're capable this morning, can you stand with us and honor God's holy Word as we read from James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Gives you another chance to stretch your legs before we get into this preacher preaching this morning. So beginning in verse 1 of James chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things, just as Brother Hugh's song said this morning. And if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. And now the word perfect means mature, meaning he is spiritually maturing. And he is able also to bridle the whole body, so the tongue is going to affect what the body does or 
It has definitely a sign of what's going on in the body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they're very large, so very large, and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things, See how great a forest, how, how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile or creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and our Father, and with it we curse men and who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. And he says, my brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine bear figs? No. Thus, it, no, it springs yields both salt. Uh, the, thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. We'll just stop right there for now. Fathers, we read these scriptures, we're reminded of the, the power of the tongue, what the tongue says about us what it reveals about us. And God, that it seems to be much like the bits in a horse's mouth or the rudder of a ship. It seems to, to tell what direction we're going in and, and kind of point us in a direction. God, may we, may we understand that that tongue this morning is a symptom. It's, a, it's an indicator of what's going on in our heart. And God, so I pray this morning that you would, you would teach us from your word how that we can be better examples in our world, and how that we can have a heart change, and that'll create a tongue change, and that'll create a life change. Oh, God, speak today is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being, being participating in that reading this morning. Each week we gather here and we read the scriptures and we... We gather here to hear what God has to say. I, I don't think I come to church to tell you a bunch of stories, to make a bunch of jokes, to, to, to just give you things out of Reader's Digest. Somebody will say this morning, Preacher, what are you preaching out of? I said, I'm preaching out of the Bible today. Next week, I think I'll do Reader's Digest. Amen, Brother Chuck? And so, so I, I, but I just try to say, hey, we're going to hear what God has to say from the Word of God. So when I share something with you, it's going to come right out of Scripture. It's going to come right from God. And if, you, if you've not been a, or know much about the Bible, this, this book right here has been around for a long time. A lot of folks have tried to destroy this book. In fact, some of the famous uh, unbelievers in years past have said that they were going to destroy this book. But this book's been a part of their memorial service at the end of their life. And uh, there are those that uh, uh, have denied it. But the, I know one of those, uh, uh, I'll not give the name, but uh, his home is now the headquarters for the American Bible Society. And, uh, but he denied this book. This book is, has been around. There's more history on this book than anything else historically that you can imagine. And it's full of the words of God. And I believe had it, it would not have lasted had it not been of God. It is God who has sustained it when the Hitlers of the world tried to burn it up. It is God who sustained this book when the haters said, we don't want to hear what God has to say. But I thank you that you've come this morning just to listen, just to give God a, a chance to know and to hear what God has to say today about this very practical subject. Maybe you didn't know you would be here for a message on the tongue today because this is probably one area we all still struggle a little bit, isn't it? Hello? Isn't it amazing that of a scale of 1 to 10, if you were to kind of evaluate, if you were trying to evaluate where you were on a scale of 1 to 10, spiritually, 1 being just very still immature, baby in Christ, 10 being a, a person who has, has been saved and now walking in the Spirit, 
loving the Lord, blessed by God, you know, you'd be a 10. But, but where are you on that scale? One of the ways that we know where we are on that scale is really by, by what comes out of our mouth. Because it does reveal what's in our heart. And, it, and the tongue is one of those things that shows our level of maturity. Today, I, I kind of had a subtitle for this. It was called, A Tongue is a Terrible Thing to Waste. <laughs> you know, and it's full of, it's so full of blessings, but yet many times it becomes something that is used for cursing, as we see in the scriptures here. Let's look at some things about it. I've got five things listed there in the outline in your bulletin this morning, if you want to fill in the blanks. The first one is this, comes from the first verse. I call it the purpose test. If you and I were to test our spirituality by our tongue, by how we use our tongue, where would you be? What is the purpose of the tongue? Well, he obviously gives us one example there in verse 1 where he talks about some being teachers and uh, those who uh, are ready to share truth. Now, God does call and gift some people to be teachers. Not everybody's going to be a teacher. Apparently, in James's day, there were a lot of people wanting to teach, had their own ideas. And maybe some didn't work very scriptural in some of the things they were teaching. So James just kind of warns them in this first verse that, that hey, those of you, don't, don't necessarily be rushing out there to be a teacher because you're going to be held accountable for what you teach with that tongue and what comes out of your mouth as a teacher. Two things about this. Uh, in two ways, I guess we'd say, in the purpose of the tongue. First of all, there's what I call a positive way, which is edification. That's what a teacher does. That's what someone who is a, an encourager, a challenger does. They use their tongue to encourage, to edify others. That word edify means to build up. And so a, a positive use of the tongue is something that wants to build others up, to encourage others, to share good things. For example, I can go through my life talking about all the things I hate and I can let all the ugly things come out of my life or it can come out of my mouth words of life, words that are encouraging. For example, if we go to our world today, and here's the role of the church. Here's the purpose of the church. The number one focus of the church is this, to make sure the world knows that God has a plan for their life and that through Jesus Christ we can have a more full and meaningful life. Life can be an awesome thing. Sometimes people in the, the world may think that we just talk about what happens after death. But I want you to know, Jesus said we could have an abundant life here. Not just after this life is over when we go to heaven. God says we can have an abundant life here. And one of the ways that we do that is by being that person who is optimistic. Why am I optimistic? I try to be optimistic, and I guess... I guess some things in the world are hard when we deal with that, but, but when I say optimistic, I want people to know that no matter what you've done, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God will still give you grace this morning. He'll still save you this morning no matter what you've done. Now, that's a positive message, amen? And that's a, I can be confident because I'm not afraid of this life. I know if I die tomorrow, I'm going to heaven, amen? I don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds because I know God has a wonderful plan for me. And so the tongue is something that can build up. It can, can be something that is helping and encouraging and, and, and helps us along the way. You know, when you get down, you don't need somebody to come along and kick you. You need somebody to help you up. And so that's what we do by sometimes the things that we say. It can also be a negative thing that's used for destructive purposes. Yes, sometimes it's used to build up and sometimes it's used to tear down. I think about that, a person who's full of ridicule, sarcasm, fault-finding, criticism, destructive types of things, discouragement, gossip, negative things all along the way. Never likes anything, never encouraged about anything, always going to talk about how bad things are. And, and you know, that person who's never going to be there to encourage you, but in fact, in fact, I had a guy in my church one time said he had the gift of discouragement. <laughs> I said, I don't know, I read my Bible, but I don't know if I found that gift in there anywhere, the spiritual gift of discouragement. I know he was joking, but how important it is that we realize that this old tongue can sometimes be used in discouraging negative ways. I love being around an encouraging person. 
And that's a blessed person. The second thing, not only is the, what is the purpose of our tongue, but the second thing is the perfection test or the maturity test, as I said earlier, when we see here that the Bible says for in verse 2, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in his word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. What does he mean by that? Well, it means that you and I, a lot of people will know more about where you stand with God because of what comes out of your mouth. I'm here to tell you that even the Mark chapter 16, right there at the end of Jesus' ministry, one of the things he said to the disciples that would happen after they got the Holy Spirit, he said they're going to speak with a new tongue. And what that meant word, that word meant there was a new language. It didn't mean some unknown tongue. It meant a, he said, I'm going to give you a different vocabulary. How many of you in here would testify that after you got saved, you didn't say some of the things you said before you got saved? Amen. All right, we could all just about testify to that, couldn't we? Well, I can't testify to that. I'm sorry, I don't testify to that too much. I got saved when I was seven. I didn't say a lot of bad things, but I, I said a lot of ugly things, like not obeying my mom and my dad sometimes, and, and things that I probably thought about. But, uh, you know, it's important that we understand that our maturity level uh, really is gauged by, by our spiritual ability to be under self-control. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I'm teaching on the, the fruits, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit on, on Sunday nights. Tonight we'll be on uh, studying about patience. So uh, I guess I lost half my Sunday night crowd right there. They don't want to hear a sermon about patience. But, uh, but uh, tonight we'll be talking about that. But one of them is self-control. And you see, that's what happens. We have to learn that ability to spiritually be under the control of the Holy Spirit instead of under the control of our emotions. And that's usually where, if our emotions are taking over, that's usually where that comes from, comes out, and it's so seen, is from our mouth. So that person whose, whose tongue is controlled by God is very mature. That person whose tongue is controlled by their emotions, and they just say whatever they think without, sometimes people speak before their brain kicks in gear. Have you ever been around anybody like that? And, uh, but, but that person is not under the control of the Holy Spirit. So the perfection test. The third test we see here is the power test. Man, what power there is in the tongue. Verses 3 through 5, he begins to give us examples there of things that, that uh, three examples of, of the power of this little bitty thing. Uh, little bitty thing. I mean, about the size of your two thumbs, I guess. Uh, you know, but it's just a little bitty piece of our body, but it has such drastic power, like the bits of a horse. They're so small compared to the size and strength of a horse, but it can turn that horse to the left, to the right, to stop that horse. All the great power of those little bits in verse 3, and then the rudder on a ship. Even a large, large cargo carrier or oil vessel, those large ships. Several football fields on the top of it. A military aircraft carrier turned by rudders or some type of force back there. That Obviously, it may be a motor that turns. I'm not sure how the large aircraft carriers are turned. But, but a large ship turned by a small rudder. And so we look at that today. And then the third example he gives us is the, the uh, spark, basically, that can start a forest fire. Man, we see that lived out in... California every day now, don't we? In Oregon and several of those very dry places over there where one little cigarette out the window can start a forest fire. One little spark from a, from a, a lightning strike maybe can before long have burned up tens of thousands of acres. One little spot can do so much damage. And he's saying here that the mouth can do that kind of damage. It has that kind of effect. It has so much power to destroy. Why? Why? In our relationships as we talk to one another, you know, we can have a mouth that can build someone up or we can have a mouth, again, as we said earlier, can tear someone down. The things that we say. How about the gossip that we spread? For those of you that are visiting today, I told our church one time, I heard about a lady who came forward and said, Pastor, I've got a lying, gossiping tongue, and I just want to give it to God. He said, Ma'am, I'd have you lay it on the altar, but the altar's only 25 feet long. 
you know, it's, uh, it's amazing that that tongue can be so awesome, can be so powerful, can be so, I mean, it can become, it can be like a sharp whip, if you will. It can be something that strikes and something that discourages, something that turns a relationship. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you have heard a relationship before by something you said? And had you thought about it a while, you'd have, you wouldn't have said what you said. Anybody in here ever say something that you wish you wouldn't have said? Well, just every one of us could raise our hand, couldn't we, and say, I've done that. I've done that. But what a terrible thing that when we let our, our mouth kick in gear before our heart does. Or maybe, maybe that's really what's coming out of our heart. It's what Jesus said. I've heard people come around before and, and I, I, they'll... They may be buying, uh, I, mean, I mean, telling, uh, saying bad words in a story they're telling, and I walk up behind them. I, I, I love to walk up behind people when they're, you know, buying lottery tickets or, you know, church members I'm talking about, you know, or, or I walk up behind them and they're just cussing up a storm, maybe telling a joke or something, and they turn around. And I mean, you don't think eyes can get that big, but they can get pretty big. Oh, preacher, that just kind of slipped out. I don't know why I said that or, or just hoping and doing a lot of praying that you really didn't hear what they said uh, before you walked, before you got there. But, uh, but sometimes people say, well, that just slipped out. I'm going to tell you, very little slips out of us. It comes out of our heart. That's what Jesus said. Out of the fullness of that heart, your mouth will speak. We, you, prime example, you got, great, you got grandkids you want to talk about? Boy, they're just so full in your heart. You're excited about them, and you got pictures handy. You got stories to tell, and and boy, I'm telling you, you just want to talk about your babies. And you know, notice I said your grandbabies. You really like to talk about them a lot more than your kids. But uh, but you know, it's uh, it's amazing that you you know we talk about them that way we do because it's just on our heart, and we ought to think about. What's in our heart? You know, it, we have to kind of plan. Spiritually, we have to be ready for every day because you're going to be put to the test every day. Your tongue is going to get put to the test every day. Will it be a good thing? Will it give a good message? Will it give a good signal of your maturity? Or will it be something that, that really is a bad testimony? You know that you and I are building our testimony every day? You and I are building our testimony. What kind of person are you going to be? How does God see you? And one of the things that determines your spiritual testimony is your tongue. How you talk. What you say. Whether you ever talk about God. Do you ever talk about God during the week? And that's one of the challenges God's giving us here is to realize He ought to be part of our vocabulary. He ought to be that part of us that we brag about and look to. Let's move on. Number four, the poison test. The poison test. Boy, when we think about that, the tongue can be a real Poison, verses 6 through 8, he talks about that tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. He goes on and talks about how it can defile the whole body. Wow. And, and it says it's set on fire by hell. You know, when we are a defiling, when our body is very defiling, that's because we're listening to the enemy and not listening to God. We've let our, we've let our uh, hearts be filled with the things of this world, I have, I have, uh, I have friends. I'm just going to say it like that. Who work in different places, and and you know they'll tell me sometimes they'll say, you know, I work with a lot of guys who, who I know for a fact they go to church on Sundays. But he said in the workplace, on Mondays, he said they sound and they sound like a sailor that just got off a ship. They cuss, tell dirty jokes. That tells a lot about where we are spiritually, folks, if we do that. Because I'll guarantee you, we're not right with God if we sound like the world Monday through Saturday. We're not right with God. And you can sit in church all you want to, but you're not right with God if your tongue is more like the world than it is like God. And so that's a challenge he gives us here. And so for all of us, and I want to say to all of you here, that may be you this morning, 
So you're one of those broken ones among us this morning. But know that when you go to the house of God and you hear from the word of God, that when you use that kind of language, it is not fair for you to say, well, I'm just not perfect. I'm here to say to you, you are broken, if that's the kind of tongue that you have this morning. You may be a Christian, but I'm going to tell you, you know, the Bible says some are going to be saved as by fire. You know that kind of how I look at that? They just kind of barely sneaking into heaven. They hope they're going to be there. In fact, if you can ever get them to be honest, they'll say, well, I, I think I'm saved. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, I, I'm pretty sure I am. hope I am. You know what I'm so glad about? I don't ever have to use that term. I hope I am. Maybe I am. Man, I love how the Bible says that we can know that we have eternal life. But you know what? If I acted like the world, if I cussed like the world and told jokes like the world and, and drank like the world, I'd probably wonder if I was saved too. And that's a good question to ask in all our lives. Because I know the Bible teaches that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, He will make a difference in your life. He will make a difference. And so... It's important that we understand that. He says here, the tongue can defile. The tongue, verse, the last part of verse six, uh, verse 6 there says it can be even demonic. It says it's from hell. And then it can be very deadly. It talks about the beast and the creatures and all. Nothing is tamed. It's tamed by man. Uh, but no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. How's our tongue ever going to be tamed then? No man can do it. You can't fix your tongue issue without God do you hear me now you may be saved but you're not trusting God you're not walking in faith you're not living in Christ and therefore because you're not walking in the power of God you may be a baby Christian and you may be going to heaven maybe hopefully but you're not walking in the fullness of God and so this morning, I want you to know that God, you're going to have to turn to God for help with that tongue. And some of us may be saying, well, I don't, I don't cuss. But I can sure, I may not use cuss words, but I can. You ever heard of somebody saying, well, that was the look? Every now and then, you, hey, husbands, every now and then, do you get the look from your wife? It just makes you want to crawl under the recliner again. When you get to look. Well, that, sometimes the tongue is that way. We may not curse, but we can do everything but curse and tear you down the best way we can. But, you know, let's, let, we realize that we need God's help, don't we? We need God's help to let that tongue be something that builds up. And then last of all, time's about gone, the produce test. In verses 9 through 12, basically we see that that our tongue is something that should be produced. It should be productive. Just, it should be a fruit produced in our life. Well, when we look at that, does the tongue produce uh, righteousness? Does it, and, and you know, the tongue sometimes just produces a little bit of religion. But does the tongue produce fruit? I mean, do, when, when people hear you speak, do they, do they hear love, joy? Peace, gentleness, meekness, self-control, all these things are the fruits of the Spirit we're studying on Sunday nights. Does that tongue tell people that, that from you, you remember here he talks about this, this uh, spring, the water that comes from that. He says, uh, verse 11, does a spring send forth fresh water, bitter from the same opening? So when, when, when you speak, does somebody say, ah, oh, that was refreshing? Or does somebody say, man, I hate being around that guy. I hate being around that lady because, man, they're always negative, always complaining, always cussing, always running somebody down. Listen, friends, if we run somebody down, that doesn't make you look better. Sometimes we think by, by tearing somebody else down, we're going to look better. I'm here to tell you, if you're tearing other people down, that doesn't make you look any better. But we do that sometimes. And so God challenges us here to be a to let our tongue be something that blesses, something that worships God, something that elevates and, and exalts the Lord. Jesus said that our main purpose is to, to exalt the Lord, 
to lift up Jesus. And Jesus said, if I will be high and lifted up, I'll draw people to myself. In other words, there'll be a fresh spring of refreshing spiritual water that flows from us. And one of the ways it'll flow from us will be from our tongue. It'll be from our mouth. They'll, they'll know that, they'll know that we can, we're a person that they can go to and be refreshed. They can find something that's spiritually refreshing. So think about that when you go out. One of the greatest things that people should get from us on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday at work or at school well, some, would be some refreshing, encouraging, God-honoring words that point people to Jesus Christ. Jesus had a lot to say to us about words and their power. They tell a lot about us spiritually. That's why the Bible says to us, because words come from the heart, that's why the Bible says in a number of places, guard your heart for out of it comes the issues of life for out of it comes the issues of life issues we all have issues don't we we all have decisions to make the issues we're dealing with in life it could be health issues money issues family issues but I'm here to tell you that guard your heart because it's going to deal with how you deal with issues in life closing this morning I I'm always amazed at watching sporting programs and things like that and sometimes we see the foul language that it takes I'm just here to tell you when people use that foul language there's an issue in their hearts I had thought about including that earlier just that it shouldn't take the attitude of the world to motivate us and yet we see that used so many times and so I want to ask you this morning, if you're here visiting with us this morning today, maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you've never been a part of the, the Christian uh, world and, and, and part of the family of God, I want you to know something this morning. When we come to this place, we come here and we're learning how to walk with Christ better. And we're still learning. I'm going to tell you, anytime I read this chapter, <laughs> I come under conviction because I realize there's things I could say better. There's things I could be more positive about. And encouraging and so it's a challenge for all of us but if you're here this morning you've never been saved I want you to know that God loves you right where you are you ain't got to change one thing to come to God God loves you and he wants you to know he's got a wonderful plan for your life and God will help you with that mouth if you let him he'll help us all to be more encouraged I don't know about you but I want to be encouraged by life I don't want to have to depend on anything the world has I don't want to have to depend on artificial stimulants, whatever it may be, drugs, booze, whatever, to try to be enjoy, enjoy life. I'm going to tell you the greatest thing that will bring joy to your life will be what Jesus does in your heart. Because I promise you, he'll give you a reason to want to live. He'll give you a reason to want to get up every day. Why do you get up every day? Why do you get up every day and go to work? Or whatever you do, you're saying, why do you get up? Well, I got to make more money. Well, why you got to make more money? So I can pay for them things I bought last year. Oh, and so when you get all them paid for, then what you gonna do? Well, I'm gonna go buy some more things so I can get up and go to work again, so I can pay for those things I bought. And is that all life is about? It's just about working to buy some things so you can buy some more things and you can work some more. If it is, life is pretty meaningless. I want you to know it's worth a lot more. I want you to hear me, and I'm closing with this. Musicians, would you come? And let's prepare for our closing invitation. I believe with all of my heart, however long you're here on this earth, whether it's 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, I believe with all of my heart you're here on this earth to determine where you're going to spend eternity. You're here on this earth just to determine where you're going to spend eternity. God created us. He put us here on this earth. And he said, what I'm doing is developing a family that's going to spend eternity with me in heaven. And God says in a number of places, I could go right through the scripture. Let's just take Jesus where he said there's two roads, there's two gates. There's a narrow gate and there's a wide gate. And Jesus said, if you'll go through this narrow gate, 
He said, now most don't find that gate. Most people go through the wide gate, which means you can just do what you want to do. Live your life your way. Live in sin. It's all about you. He said, now most people are going to go that gate. He said, but there's a narrow gate. And he said, if you're willing to come through that gate, and that narrow, it's narrow because Jesus is the only way. And he's the door to the Father. And he said, if you be willing in your life to choose me, he said, one day I'll stand before the Father, and when you come up before God the Father, I'll look at the Father and I'll say, Father, he's ours. He's ours. Come on in. Enter in, my good and faithful servant, because you chose him on this earth. He'll choose you for all eternity to be part of his family. Wouldn't it be terrible to live this life after your own desires and your own pleasures and die and spend eternity in a place called hell? I'm going to tell you right now, we're in the midst of a test. We're in the midst of a test. Could I ask you this morning if you're following Jesus? Are you following after the world? Every one of us are following somebody. Somebody's on the throne of your life. Either you're on the throne and you're calling the shots, or God's on the throne, and you're following Him. So this morning as we close, we give an invitation every Sunday because God gives an invitation. Jesus said, whoever's thirsty, let him come. And He said, if you're burdened and heavy laden, He said, come unto me and I'll, I'll give you rest. God said, yoke up with me, and my yoke is easy. My burden is light, he said. In other words, life will be easier if you learn how to walk with me. So this morning, I want to say to you that God invites you to come. To come. To come publicly. He said, you confess me before men, I'll confess you before God in heaven. But deny me before men, and I'll deny you before the Father of heaven. This is a chance for you in one way to say, hey, I'm not ashamed of God. I'm not ashamed. And I'm willing to step out this morning and say, God, count me in as one of your followers. Now, God's asking you to recognize that you've sinned, and every one of us have sinned, haven't we? Every one of us. And because of that sin, we can't take our sin to a perfect place called heaven. Heaven is a place where there is no sin. So the only thing that can happen is we must have our sin vanquished. We must have it washed away. And that's why Jesus came, and he said, I'll take your sin." And you take my life. Take me as your Savior. Follow me. And you can enter into heaven. This morning, if you've never done that and would like to, I'm going to stand here in the front. I'm going to ask a couple of our deacons if they'd come down and one on each side over here, just in case you want somebody to pray with you about something. If you want them to pray with you about something, they'd be glad to do that. Matt, Danny, why don't y'all come down and be willing to pray with people this morning? But if you want to join our church, maybe you're already a Christian and you want to be a part of this church, you come this morning. I already had one couple tell me they wanted to do that. And so you come this morning. Let God have his way. Let's stand together. Fathers, we come into this time of invitation. We ask you, God, to speak. We ask you, Lord, to speak to our hearts. We know, God, that we're not here this morning because we're worthy. We're not here this morning, God, because we're perfect. But God, we're here to learn. We're here to grow in our faith and learn how to follow you. So God, this morning I pray that you would continue to call people to your church. Continue to call people, Father, to your family. And God, help us to be willing to turn from our sin and turn to Jesus Christ. And learn to be obedient to him. Learn to follow him and trust him. So God, bless this morning right now as only you can. Call people to your family. And God, give them the courage to say yes. And step out this morning and receive you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you come this morning, just say to me, if you're not saved and want to be saved, I want you to say three words. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. You come this morning as we sing. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. 
no one else will do. Cause nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, Lord, bring me back to you. You're all I want. You're all I ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. Nothing else will do. Cause nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, Lord, bring me back to you. You're all I want. You're all I ever needed. You're all I want. just remain standing uh, I want to introduce a couple that come this morning but before I do that I want to let all of you know tonight come back if you can that we have our classes at, well no we're not having the classes tonight because we've got a movie tonight uh, the movie's going to start at five o'clock if you're searching for really uh, uh, maybe you're just spiritually searching there's a great and this movie we're showing tonight it's called the case for Christ it's about by Lee Strobel and uh, he wrote the book on it first. He was a reporter out of New York, I believe it was. Then uh, he went on a, a, a campaign, if you will, uh, years ago to try to disprove the Bible and the resurrection. And he researched it and was going to write articles to, to disprove the Bible. And uh, in that research, he found out the Bible was true. And he got saved. And since that time, he's been writing books. He's written The Case for Faith, The Case for Christ. But we're going to show that movie tonight, The Case for Christ. And it's his life story. It's, and uh, so you want to come, maybe see that. It's going to be at 5 o'clock. going to be in the fellowship hall back there. We're going to have popcorn and uh, some tea and stuff like that to drink coffee. And so if you want to come, be a part of that. I think we've got a bunch of desserts left over back there from this weekend. And uh, you can help us finish all that stuff off. But... Uh, Come tonight, if you can, 5 o'clock, and we'll have a good time back there together, uh, fellowship, and uh, doing a movie. Hey, Kevin, y'all come up here. This is Kevin DeMoss, and uh, Penny, or maybe you knew her as Renee. Sometimes she's Penny Renee when she acts bad. That's what they call her, Penny Renee. But uh, <laughs> well, we got a Dewana and a Juanita, so it just depends on which one shows up. But her last name is Brooks. Her and Kevin are engaged and going to get married. And, uh, but they want to put their membership here with us and be a part of our church. I, uh, I grew up with Kevin, and uh, he was a little younger than I was. But, there, but we're not going to ask y'all to vote on him today because he is kin to Dale. And 
And I know right then, that means about 25% of you would vote against him. But you're not like Don't Dale, are you? No, he, yeah, he told me not to tell nobody. Yeah, and, but we're not going to hold that against you. Uh, anyway, we are glad to have them here today. They're going to join by a statement of their faith this morning. Uh, and then the Phillips, where are they at? They came last week. Y'all come on down here too. Ronnie and Stacy. I knew that. So come on on this side, Ronnie and Stacy. Y'all come down here. And they came after the service last week and said they wanted to join. And uh, we just went ahead and filled out their paperwork. And I wanted to make sure they came and that you knew they wanted to join also. And, uh, but anyway, I want you to come, have a chance to come by and just see them, say hello, and, and get to know them. Tell them who you are. They'll remember all your names at the end of the service. But uh, before next week, we'll test them on it. But uh, no, we're just excited about what God is doing and adding people to our church. And uh, if you're not one of us and want to be one of us, we'd love to have you come be a part of what God's doing here. You say, why have church members like that? Well, church membership just means that we're locking arms together. It just means that we're going to work together. We want you to feel like a part of this family, not just feel like a visitor all the time. We want you to feel like you're one of us. And so that's kind of what that means. And we hold each other accountable, and we pray for each other. And so we're thankful for them coming this morning. You come by and see them when our service is over today. Again, the movie at 5 today. If you're searching for some truth and want to know more about just kind of what did he go through in this search for truth, well, we're going to watch that tonight, kind of how he searched for truth, okay? Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed being here today, and I uh, hope you were blessed. And so, again, thanks for coming. And uh, Brother Wayne, you got something? Yes, sir. Thank you. We had the biggest turnout for work day yesterday that we've had in a long time. You'll notice our steeples, how great they look. Man, uh, uh, Kate's, uh, Corey, I started to say Casey. Corey, I knew it wasn't right. Corey Gregory came yesterday, and he worked on those steeples and worked on them, worked on them. But I don't think it was what Casey did. It was what Ronnie and Casey's daddy did. They sat on the ground and watched. <laughs> I think he just had such great supervision. I think that's what it was caused by all that. He had great supervision. And uh, anyway, we, thanks for all of you that came and helped yesterday. Let's dismiss in prayer. Danny, would you dismiss, please, sir?